My name is Tom Switzer and I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Independent Studies and it's great to see so many people here this evening for a very special occasion. Now since 1901, since Federation, since our independence from Britain, Australian Prime Ministers uh, can be put into two categories. Uh, there are those who enter politics as very pliant politicians uh, with no real coherent set of beliefs. Uh, they all too often uh, struggle in power. They're always uh, the victim of events. They're never in control of events. And as a result, uh, they leave little of any worth as a legacy. But there is a second category, uh, truly exceptional individuals uh, with the ability and the will to shape history. Uh, they enter office with clearly thought out views about governance. Uh, they're all too often sound in style and substance and they stick pretty closely to those ideals. Well, I think it's fair to say by any objective standard, our special guest tonight also fits that category. John Winston Howard, Prime Minister from March 1996 to November 2007. Um, federal Liberal leader twice, uh, from 1985 to 1989, and then of course from uh, 1995 uh, right through to 2007. He was also Treasurer in Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser's government uh, from 1977 to uh, 1983. Now, whatever one thought of uh, John Howard and his politics and his policies, and we should stress he had no shortage of detractors during his 33 year in public life. But whatever one thinks of John Howard's politics, it's widely believed that in British parlance, he made the political weather. He combined sound conservative convictions about the economy, uh, education, culture, our way of life, our nation's place in the world. He combined those sound convictions with the kind of prudence that defines this book, A Sense of Balance. It's published by HarperCollins. And with that, please welcome John Winston Howard. Thank you, Tom. And Tiki Fulton is one of our nation's leading journalists. For many years, she's been a leading reporter, uh, presenter of news, uh, presenter of documentaries at both the ABC and Sky News Australia. She's also a prominent journalist at The Australian. Please welcome Tiki Fulton. <laughs> Tiki, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Mr. Howard, it is wonderful to be sitting down with you. And uh, I don't know whether it's my age, but uh, there's something, I think, rather grown up about the idea of talking to a prime minister about a sense of balance. <laughs> um, especially when the country would seem to be a long way from comfortable and relaxed. Would you agree with that? Oh, not. It's more comfortable and relaxed now than... It was post-1975. Um, That's not saying very much. <laughs> and I think post-1983, I mean, it, the pinnacle of comfort and relaxation was, of course, um, those slumberous, prosperous years of five, six and seven before uh, there was a change. <laughs> <laughs> well, look... Uh, I really enjoyed the book. I enjoyed how accessible it was, actually. I thought it was a very easy read, and you dip in and out of uh, your, your, your thoughts. I want to start at the end uh, of your book, which is really about the election. Uh, this Labour victory came at the expense of really previously rostered on liberals, uh, not just in safe seats, but in the most traditional seats. How did the party get the balance wrong there? Well, I think the biggest deficiency in the coalition's campaign was it didn't have um, a plan for the future. I know that's a hackneyed expression, but it does matter, particularly for a party that's been in the vanguard of economic reform for 30 years. Mm. It didn't have any plan for the future. I think that was a real deficiency. 
There were other reasons, and you've got to put that election in context. It was the most grudging change of government since World War II. The winning party got 32.75% of the primary vote. Uh, the coalition actually got more, but because of the preferential system, which I strongly support, incidentally, um, the Labor Party won. And one of the other interesting things, if <laughs> you look at it, uh, the, the two extremes of the political spectrum occupied on the left by the Greens and on the right by the National Party, and not that I, I hesitate to say I don't really regard the National as extreme, but I'm just using it almost in a figurative sense, those two parties did best. The Greens won three seats, mm. astonishingly successful, and the Nats didn't lose any ground, as always happens when the coalition gets booted out of office, the Liberals take the hit, and when we come back in, the Liberals win all the seats. That's just the nature of politics. So in that sense, uh, it was an interesting election. Um, you, say, you say in the book that there was no clear ideological no. message. Um, was the church... Uh, broad enough, or too broad, perhaps, for one ideological message? Well, I just don't think it, the, the party got around to defining what it wanted to do in the future. Mm. And you've always got to say, well, if you re-elect us, we will do this and this and this. I thought that was the greatest deficiency. Now, we had been in power for nine years yeah, there was an it's time thing. There was an it's time factor. And, and you also say that you often left with the feeling during the last 12 months, you say, of the government, uh, that there were few Liberals saying anything on its behalf beyond the Prime Minister, Treasurer, Defence and, and obviously Greg, oh. Greg Hunt. Now, was that because energy and women were just too tricky? Uh, look, I, I, I don't have a, a complete answer for that, Tiki. I do think that um, uh, there were some remarkably quiet people mm. in very significant positions in the government. Let me put it that way. That's very polite and very diplomatic. And you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> I, I tell but you, I do think that, you know, the, the exceptions to that were, were obviously Josh Frydenberg, who I thought was the um, standout performer. Uh, of the government um, in, in, in every way, and I'm really quite mortified uh, that he lost his seat, and I hope he comes back. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Dutton was a great warrior, and I thought Greg Hunt was a superb ministerial technician in his area. But, I mean, I do say in the book that the, the, the Minister for Women, Maurice Payne, should have defended the Prime Minister uh, against uh, the, un, the, the attacks that were made on him as being insensitive to women, although, I mean, I thought his attack on Christine Holgate was a terrible mistake. And I, I think that was, a, that was quite a call-out in your book, actually. I was well, surprised well, you. I, well, I just thought it was a terrible mistake. I know Christine Holgate and I don't think she did anything wrong. I, I think I, the, the spirit of private enterprise says if you do something good, the company ought to reward you. And whether it's in money or whatever, I, I just couldn't. I, I, but anyway, people make errors, and we all make errors in, in when we occupy high positions. But but going back to the message, um, you the said, message is more important than yeah. the people. Yeah. So in the twenty nineteen election, the coalition had success, arguing that Labor would undermine Australia's fossil fuel industries and and jobs. By twenty twenty one, the climate was a much bigger issue. Uh, wasn't yes, it? but I think two thousand and nineteen was very much a referendum on Bill Shorten's tax increases. Mm hmm. And that was, the de that was the defining issue in, mm -hmm. in 2019 was if Shorten was going to put your tax up. Remember that, that worker in North Queensland who asked him, are you going to increase my tax? And he walked away. Yes. Uh, and, I mean, that just said it all. Uh, and and that, was, that was absent this time. And to his credit, um, Anthony Albanese, um, who, the, you know, the now Prime Minister, uh, his small target strategy... Mm. Uh, turned out to be quite shrewd, although I, I, I don't so, think it should extend to visiting American athletes. So, uh, Mr. Howard, what what do, <laughs> what do what does the party do with these uh, teal ladies? Well, I think what the party does is to avoid this stupid suggestion that we need a different strategy for outer metropolitan seats, and and uh, than the one for seats like the one I live in, in which is North Sydney, 
or Wentworth. I think we just have to um, make sure that we get sensible policies in, in accordance with our philosophy and develop them well enough before the next election and we'll get some of the Teal supporters back. We won't get them all. But don't underestimate the possibility that there is a, a one-off phenomenon in this. Uh, I, mean, look, I, I understand the dynamic. I, mean, I live in the lower North Shore of Sydney, so I understand the mood of North Sydney. I have a combination of circumstances. I, I know the electorate of Wentworth extremely well. Yes. And, uh, very, and I know all of that. But I just think um, there will probably be a little subsidence in the normal course of events at the next election. How much will depend on how... So it comes back to how this climate issue is going to no, play out, not, don't no, you No, think? not only that. I think economics. I think if you get any significant tax rises, yes. you could get some people wondering why they voted other than Liberal. So, for example, a, a businesswoman like Allegra Spender, that might... Make her think twice, do you well, think? Well, I, mean, I mean, I know Allegra. I know her father even better. Um, he's an old colleague of mine, a good friend. But um, I, I, I think the, the, the ex-liberal constituency that voted for the Teals, yes. I mean, many of them simply did because they were cranky with us, couldn't bring themselves to vote Labor, and so they voted Teal. Now, if the Labor Party does something uh, that... <laughs> Uh, really offends them, uh, they're going to come, some of them will come back. But do you think, okay, here's one for you. You are agnostic on climate change. Yes, I am. Is and, it? And I'm probably in a minority on that, but you might I don't think I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm you don't. I'm agnostic on climate change, not on so the, Mr. the Hope, belief system that is normally associated with that word, let me make clear. Given, uh, given that you are agnostic, publicly declared agnostic on mm. climate change, do you think in Australia today it's possible to be a prime minister and be publicly agnostic on climate change? Well, I think, you know, in the time-honoured response, that's very hypothetical. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to be aspiring for the job again. Um, I don't think the current Prime Minister is agnostic. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I think we'll hear in months ahead Peter Dutton's position, but I mean, I, I am, you know, I find it increasingly difficult to accept the religious zeal with which Climate alarmism has been embraced by the community. I, I'm moved by the fact that people of India want the sort of standard of living that we took for granted 30 years ago and yes. they can't get that I without thought, cheap electricity. And uh, I thought you made a wonderful point in your book about constitutional change, that amendment that you wanted uh, to eliminate the double dissolution. Yes. Uh, you know, as, as a precondition of a joint sitting of Parliament, you're saying if, if that had actually happened, the mm. 2007 Rudd emissions trading scheme would have got through. That's right. I mean, the, uh, under the uh, present, you know, it, it's clear, under the present constitutional provision, if you, um, you know, if you have a deadlock and you present the bill a second time and it's still voted down, mm. then um, if, if you want to pursue with the bill, you've got to have a double dissolution. Now, my amendment proposed amendment is that you have a joint sitting without the necessity to have another election. And and if you looked at the numbers yeah. in Rudd's amendment, you would never have had that absurd situation in 2009, was it? Mm. When the Greens voted with the coalition against Rudd's plan. It was a, you know, a, a classic historic example of the perfect being the enemy of the good. So when we think about left-right politics, mm. Labor versus capital. <coughs> is, that still, is that still right, Labor versus capital? Or, or is it now about social issues? Well, I, <coughs> I, think, it's, I think it's a mixture. I mean, it, Labor versus capital takes centre stage when things go wrong. Mm. Things weren't going too wrong with the economy mm. until COVID came along and the government of the day, and with my support, essentially put the country into recession to save lives and protect health, and then felt it had to bail it out by going into debt. I mean, one of the things that I hope the coalition keeps reminding the public of 
is that the huge debt that the now government says it inherited was a bipartisan debt. I mean, both sides but you, you say you hope, but is the party now well, I don't embracing it's, big it's, government? Has it given it, up on reform? No, no, no. It, 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 Tiki, it's still early days. I mean, I know from both being in opposition in the early days and government in the early days, you're sort of, you know, you're banging on the, on the window and nobody's taking much notice. <laughs> and, and, and you just have to wait until um, uh, people are. I mean, I, I saw a bit of... You know, I'm talking very in a very partisan way, and I apologise. No, oh, please do. <laughs> those in the audience who may not share my political uh, prejudices, but you know, I thought there was a bidding of a glimmer of hope at the weekend when the prime minister, you know, brought that big man into the room. I thought I thought that was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous. I mean, he would have made, you know, even the combination of the two political giants of Fraser and Whitlam <laughs> look, look, look into living a little on me. And, uh... All right, so let's get to reform. Yes. Um, you have a lovely chapter in your book called, uh, where you talk about reform being a, a, a one way street, a bipartisanship. It, yes, in terms of support. That you got um, now. Uh, I I do wonder about where we are going more broadly with reform. You you talk about Tony Abbott's achievement building in bringing in the uh, the building commission. Mm. Now that's gone. Well, now. it's been neutered. Yes. Um, mm. Yeah. So um, wh where where is the next place for reform? Do you think? Well, the sort of reform that I think is necessary is I don't think on present indications it's going to come from the Labor government. I think we still have to shift the burden of taxation away from an over-reliance on personal tax to a still greater reliance on indirect tax. I know it's an old, you know, an old saw, so to speak, but it's, it's nonetheless relevant. Um, I, I think our industrial relations system is still um, mired in the past. We've gone backwards on industrial relations. How do you think this whole um, COVID, Russia, everybody bringing it back, onshoring, national security, how is that working perhaps in favour of union re-empowerment? Well, it, obviously, uh, union re-empowerment is, is, occurs when you have a Labor government because they change the rules and I mean, they tilt the playing field in favour of unions. Now, I But globalisation has been pulled back. The immigrants aren't here. Uh, yeah, well, globalisation has only... I mean, you say it's been pulled back. I don't think the benefits of globalisation have disappeared. I mean, the greatest manifestation of how benefit beneficial globalisation has been is a way in which we've lifted more people out of poverty in the last 30 years than at any time since the Industrial Revolution. Mm. Now, that's, that's pretty good. And, and, and I don't want to see that disappear. Um, I mean, you, you, you have to bear in mind that, that, that you know, the, the new Labor government does have a different ideological bent on a number of things. Now, um, I think what they've said on foreign policy to date has been sound. Mm. Uh, I don't have any major argument. I think Penny Wong's uh, statements are, uh, have been good. And I, it seems to be a reasonably bipartisan position on Taiwan, on China. Um, I mean, China is the big foreign policy uh, riddle, challenge, whatever, for Australia for mm. years into the future. Um, and fortunately in opposition then, just, just on Taiwan, mm. uh, it, you know, I notice again in the book you say that that for some time now both sides in Washington mm. have been asked not to uh, poke uh, oh. the tiger, if you like. Uh, and so, what do you make of Nancy Pelosi's visit? I thought that was more of a. <laughs> I mean, I supported it because I think people should be able to visit countries. But isn't that provocative? And, yeah, but I, I thought that was her saying how strong she is inside the democratic firmament. 
the Democratic Party for them. And I, I think that. But the point I was making hmm. is that I was struck how keen the Bush administration was on telling the Taiwanese not to overdo it. I, I think there's benefit in maintaining the ambiguity of the communique that was put out in Shanghai in 1971 about both sides, recognising that there is but one China without saying what, which the one China was. I mean, it was marvellous, beautifully ambiguous, and people say, oh, you should end that ambiguity. Yeah, you end that ambiguity, uh, you provoke Beijing big time. Yes. All right, well, look, you've taken me delightfully off to the Middle Kingdom. But I just want to finish up on, uh, on, on the job summit before we get to foreign. Um, That's a big jump, the Middle Kingdom. Is, yeah, summit. well, I'm, I'm pulling, pulling you back here. Um, I wanted to ask you about industry super yes. and the power of industry super now. Um, I mean, we have, for example... Uh, this idea of industry-wide bargaining that's being floated around ahead of the summit by the unions. Um, when I, I put that to industry super as to which side they'd come down on, there was no comment. No. Well, the superannuation funds are the sort of, in, in, in many respects, the industry super funds are the trade union backstop in the face of declining membership. Mm. I mean, one of the chapters in the book is called Bowling Alone, yeah. which talks about the decline in the membership of all sorts of organisations. Yeah. And it specifically refers to bowling alleys in America where uh, the Robert Putman wrote that in his book with that title that years ago people used to go to bowling alleys in groups and he found, fascinatingly, that increasing number went individualistic on their own, and he found that out because the beer and pizza sales had declined, uh, and uh, which you know, was probably good. But the, I mean, every organisation now compared with several generations ago has fewer members. Yes. Political parties have fewer members, churches have fewer members, parents and citizens associations, even local sporting clubs. So the list goes on. And in, in, in the face of that, uh, you have a, a, a society where um, it's far easier for zealous groups to get control uh, of uh, organisations and political parties. Uh, I mean, I see that. I mean, factionalism in the Liberal Party is far more intense now than it was 40 years ago. Mm. That's because a greater proportion of active people in the Liberal Party are, are those who have whose sole sort of interest in life is politics now. I have to plead guilty that at some time some people thought sole interest in my life was politics, and I, I suppose it was, but there was a difference. Uh, years ago, you did politics at night or at the weekend. One of the things that's happened uh, since Fred Daly introduced larger numbers of staff for, for local members is that uh, there's now a career path that can take you from school, university, if you're labour inclined, to the union office, and then to a Member of Parliament's office and then hopefully you get pre-selected. Mm -hmm. The Liberal side, you might give the union office a miss on the way <laughs> or it might give you a miss, but, but, but the point is, so I think... You talk a lot about that, about the politicisation, about pre-selections, yeah, about how... And it all because started with the Because years ago, they were more competitive. Yeah. I, I stood for two federal pre-selections. I stood for the pre-selection for the seat of Barara after Tom Hughes retired and I was one of the unsuccessful 32. And then I stood for Benelong a year, 18 months later, and I was the successful out of 25. But when Joe Hockey was appointed ambassador to the United States, only three people nominated for North Sydney, which was then held on a margin of 16, 18%. And, uh, mm. uh, and, and, and and you had a ridiculous situation. And I say it's ridiculous because I effectively said that in the book at the last uh, uh, election, people nominated against three sitting members. But those pre-selections should have gone ahead. That, that they should not so, have So been. what does this say to um, young Liberals? Well, I think well, I mean, what it says is understand whatever your ideological point of view is, understand that a party that believes in free enterprise and competition 
should extend that belief to the choice of its candidates. And, 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 and the real test is the test of the market. Uh, I mean, it's a long time ago, and, but I was challenged for pre-selection by somebody uh, in 19, before the 1980 election. He was very unhappy with some anti-tax avoidance legislation I'd brought in and uh, um, uh, on the current scheme. And he mounted his argument. He complained about the retrospective element in it. And mm -hmm. I, I, no, I didn't like it. And some people tried to talk him out of it, but he went ahead and I won the pre-selection by 47 to 3, but I still, I went through the, <laughs> no, but I went through the pre-selection. Yeah. And, and, but how, and, do you, how do you unwind this now? It well, seems well, to be point so out, you point out that it all contributed to our loss. Mm. That's the way you try and unwind it. And, and, and look at the, the Labor Party. I mean, that disgraceful episode in Fowler of parachuting Christina Christine Kalini. Mm. Yeah, the paratrooper, as I called her. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, she, cert she certainly got her, her comeuppance. Yes, but, but, but to come up and to by the electorate, God bless it. Yes. Uh, uh, that yes. was the electorate that gave it. And that's in the end, that's the real test. Mm. And, and I, I just think that when you've lost an election, if you're ever going to have a... Uh, a, a frank and fearless uh, discussion about some of the internal maladies of political parties, you've got to do it immediately afterwards. And otherwise, people come to, oh, no, don't talk about that, Neil. Peril our chances. Well, uh, you don't imperil the chances of a party built on competition and free enterprise by discouraging it. One of the ways I would imagine that as a leader you can drive reform is by having a very stable government. Mm -hmm. uh, which you did. I don't think you had anybody... <laughs> no, no, we had for the only time since Federation, yes. we had the same three people occupying the three key positions, Prime Minister, Treasurer and Foreign Affairs in myself. And no one contested Peter your Cost leadership while you were... Pardon? No one contested your leadership no, while no, you were sitting? No, no, no. No. People may have put longing eyes on it, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's human nature. I mean, I, mean, I confess to... But how, had... how difficult has it been for various prime ministers over the last 10, 15 years to see former leaders sitting there on the back bench or, if not, knocking around still and interfering? How damaging <laughs> has that been to progress? Well, it, it has been, but it's been a product of unresolved policy differences or the fact that unlike earlier years, I instance uh, the McEwen veto on McMahon and the removal of John Gorton, the mm. fundamental causes in those cases were policy. Although everybody talks now in retrospect, it was all personality, but the big difference between uh, McMahon and, uh, and McEwen was that McEwen was a, a protectionist, interventionist, and McMahon, and he had plenty of critics, and he had a lot of faults, like all of us, but he was a, more of a free trader, and he was a believer in less government intervention. They argued bitterly over the level of the Australian dollar, um, uh, and and they argued bitterly over you know, the AIDC and so forth. Whereas when Malcolm Turnbull got the leadership against Tony Abbott. Mm. I, I reread his, his you know, speech declaring his intention to challenge and he didn't really single out anything other than Tony having lost uh, 30 news polls as a, as a reason. It wasn't a fundamental... Which is what he then did. Hmm? Which is what he then did. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, this is the problem. Um, uh, if, if you have a leadership change based on just personalities and factional differences, mm. you're going to perpetuate the problem. But if it's based on a, a philosophic difference, um, uh, it, it, that is not the case. And I think there is a, a real difference. And I lived through, not in Parliament, and I didn't come into Parliament until 74, uh, but there was still the you know, lingering impact of Gorton removal. Now, the, the reason, the real reason why John Gorton was brought down was I mean, sure, there were personal criticisms and everything and alleged lack of di discipline, but there was a fundamental view of it. He was a centralist. And, that, and that's something that ran, runs deep in the Liberal Party, and less so now. But I was regarded by 
some people in the Liberal Party as being a centralist. You know, I, I came from Sydney to start with, and 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 uh, uh, I, I was unsympathetic to the federal understanding. No, I don't think I, you know, I believe in federalism, but I'm above all an Australian nationalist, and so was Gordon. But Gordon was brought down for that reason, mm. uh, and 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 the two of the people who can who worked hard to bring him down were the two Liberal premiers, Bob Askin and Henry Bolly, who who were two extremely powerful figures in the Liberal Party. And you never underestimate, you certainly didn't then, perhaps less so now, never underestimate in the Liberal Party the influence and power of long-serving premiers of the two most populous states. I mean, they were really very influential. So I think one of the things that has changed a lot is that some of the differences now are based more on personality whims, factional allegiances uh, and, and all that's involved in... Um, <laughs> preferment trading uh, in, in those... Uh, and and so you, you mentioned personalities. How do you read Trump and the Rust Belt, Boris Johnson and the Red Wall, and to some degree Scott Morrison and the tradies, all happening at around the same time, really? Oh, look, there's... there's Is it inequality? No, no, no. Well, I think there's clearly a common theme in that. Yeah. Well, there's, there, there certainly is, and there's no doubt of the, I mean, the, the Howard Battlers. Uh, in, interesting, the seat in which that expression was given birth, 1996, Lindsay saw an increase in the Liberal vote yeah. <coughs> at the last election, which yeah. was a very, you know, quite a tribute to Melissa McIntosh, who yeah. has really identified with that area. Look, my view about Trump was that I said it at the time that I trembled at the prospect of him becoming president, and I, I was. I didn't have a vote, not being an American, but I was very equivocal about him in 1916. Uh, I don't know who I would have voted if I'd had a vote. But in 2020, mm. um, I'd have voted for Trump ahead of Biden because I thought Biden ha had exhibited the early stages of, of cognitive decline. But since Trump has behaved so atrociously, after losing the election. I mean, part of democracy is however unhappy you are, you've got to accept the result. I didn't like losing... So, so why is it not possible in the whole of the United States of America to find a credible, likeable Republican candidate? Well, the jury's still out on that. They haven't chosen their next candidate. But I think... <laughs> I have to say this, that we, you know, we spend a lot of time comparing ourselves with different countries, particularly America, but... I think we have a superior political system. I think parliamentary democracy is better than presidential democracy. Mm. But we're not going to change our system, or I hope we're not, and the Americans are not going to change theirs. But we've, we've seen this terrible situation arise in relation to the abortion debate in America. Now, I don't want to debate the substance of it. I mean, but that's your point about the Bill of Rights, really, but, yeah, isn't I, it? I think yeah. a Bill of Rights is terrible. And I think the idea that um, uh, these issues should be decided by the courts... And At not, their pleasure, yeah. And, and, mm. I, mean, it, I mean, it was mm. decided by the courts in Roe v Wade. Years later, it's overturned by the courts. And, and, and whatever view you have, if you were um, uh, pro-life in Roe v Wade, you thought that was terrific. And now, if you were pro-choice, to use the American language, mm. uh, the overturning of it is terrible. Now, that's a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. If it's determined as it is ultimately in, 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 in Australia and in Britain by the publics, by them directly or through Parliament, at least you get some acceptance. Mm. I mean, I, I remember at the time when this was being debated very heavily in Australia, talking to some people who were very had very conservative views on, on abortion and, and, and said... Said, they had said to me, look, we accept that if we want the laws changed, we've got to persuade the parliament to change the laws. We've got to persuade the public to persuade the parliament. Yeah. The idea of getting the courts to decide, and, and you know, I'm a, as most people know, I'm, I'm a social conservative, but I'm, I'm trying to analyse um, uh, the, the impact of the different systems of government. And I think if we want to copy America to advantage, we ought to look to their economic system, which is far less regulated than ours is, and less to their political system, which I think 
compared with ours does not work very well at all. All right. Now, as we sort of <laughs> went over to America, um, uh, the CIS had a wonderful gala evening last week with, mm. uh, with Ambassador John Bolton. Now, he was very passionate, obviously, uh, about the fact that the US can be everywhere. Can there be should, what? Can be everywhere. There is no such thing as a pivot of the US to, mm. uh, to, 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 to our, our region or a mm -hmm. pivot to... The US can and will be everywhere. Do you agree with that? Well, I certainly agree with, about the pivot. I was amazed at the currency that expression was given when Obama came here. Mm. I thought, um, uh, having been involved in two massive land wars in Asia, Korea and Vietnam, it was evidence that <laughs> America had pivoted to Asia, but never left after she entered World War II. I, th I just could, couldn't, as a concept, uh, I mean, I, admittedly Nixon's Guam doctrine slightly uh, qualified the, the involvement in Asia, but I, I, I agree with Bolton completely on that. So the, the, the muckiness around Iraq after the war and the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Well, no, no, but that's a separate... I mean, I, mean, I'm, I, I, I thought... The this is not spreading thin, is all I'm uh, saying. Yeah, yeah, but I thought the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a... Uh, the blame can be laid at the feet of both Trump and Biden on that. I mean, Trump reached an agreement with the Taliban, didn't he, before uh, the Taliban agreed on the terms of withdrawal. It should have been the other way around. Mm. And then the chaotic scenes at the end, I mean, I think those sights of those poor people running alongside the Globemaster were, were almost as haunting as people being evacuated from the embassy in uh, Saigon. Oh, yeah. Terrible. But that's, uh, I think, a product of poor decision-making. I mean, Trump was a complete contradiction, enigma on foreign policy. His Abraham Accords were great. Um, uh, he did more there than, than anybody had done for a long time. Uh, but his... Uh, and I thought he was right to call out the Europeans on defence spending. And he had the courage when, when Assad crossed the red line to, to bomb Syria. But uh, mm. he was very, very... Uh, weak and confusing on other things. But in any event, he, he gave the game away when he refused to leave the field after being given out. All right. I mean, once <laughs> you've been given out, LBW, and yeah. you've been upstairs or downstairs, whatever it is, and the finger still uh, goes up, you've got to uh, leave the field. All right, I'm going to throw to the floor in, one, in a couple of minutes, so be, get ready with your questions, please. Um, I, I cut you short on China, Mr Howard. Mm. Um, you you have a, a a very interesting chapter on China. Uh, your interaction with China as leader was uh, almost, as you say, at, the, at a time of he the heyday between yeah, America and China. Mm. Well, part of it was due to the personality of of Jiang Zemin, who was the, the Chinese president, president yeah. and probably the most interesting world leader I met. Not the one and quite one. Western, it, you know. It, it, no, I use the word interesting yes. because he was a Chinese communist leader who could speak fluent Russian, uh, so I'm told, um, uh, quite good English, which I experienced, but was prepared to live and let live internationally. And he loved Western culture and Western music. He, 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 he mm. read Shakespeare. He used to... Um, when he discovered my wife was uh, had taught Shakespeare as an English and history teacher at high school, she, he started questioning her, and he would quote something and say, "Who was that? And in what play?" And never, never caught Jeanette Allen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was she was the equal to all anything he threw at her. But he was a very he he had a genuine fascination. Yes. For uh, Western culture, I think I mentioned in the book that after we had the Shanghai meeting in. 2001 of APEC, the, you know, the, after the cultural performance, the ensemble went on stage to the tune of Old Lang Syne. And I said to him, I said, what do you use Old Lang Syne for? He said, ah, oh, Ronnie said, you remember that great movie, Waterloo Bridge? <laughs> and I had remembered what I had seen Waterloo Bridge. And he said, it was a very romantic moment. They played Old Lang Syne. And I didn't want to disagree with him because... But you was, went and checked, didn't you? I went and, and it checked was there. and it was right. Yeah. He was, just, he was dead right. So he was, he was an interesting man. Yeah. 
And and he conducted the entire APEC meeting in October of 2001 in English and he mm. delivered his plenary speech in English. Now, that was a singular act of courtesy towards particularly George Bush and, and, and I mean, there, were, there were a number of us there whose mother tongue was English, but... Right. And then, and then, of course, we had the joint address from the two leaders yeah, later two here leader in day Australia. Out, we had George Bush on one day and yeah. Hu Jintao the next. Yeah. Now that was the high water mark. Yeah. Um, but but now, oh, well, Mr. Howard, I mean, really, the tensions are the question about whether we can sit on the fence now. Well, between... we have to sit on the fence because, it, it in 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 one sense of that term, look, it is not in our interests ever to forget that we'll always be closer to America than we are to China because we have common values and we have a common history. And, and, and let me put the view to you, I don't think the Australian public would ever accept a government that openly preferred China to America. I mean, I just think that's out of the question. It's still the received view of this country that we have an enormous debt to the Americans going back to World War II. But and the commonality of our culture and experience and all that. But China is a wonderful market. Mm. And the other thing you've got to bear in mind is I don't think it's inevitable that China will overtake America economically. China has got this terrible demographic problem. It'll be old before it's rich. Uh, and the declining birth rate in China, you project that forward and, and try to turn it around, gee... That's a slow-turning ocean liner, if ever there's one. And do you, do you think the um, the West could have done anything to stop Russia and China pushed towards each other, which just seems to be what's happening now? Uh, except if, if, if the United States at various stages under both Obama and Trump had not given in their opposite sides of the politics had not given the impression of either withdrawal from or indifference to world affairs. It might have, might have had an impact. Mm. Um, and there's, there, there's no doubt that you know, Trump's disdain for uh, involvement in military school, the ever wars, I mean, I, and I can understand it. And I can understand, you know, if you're a parent of somebody in the Middle West of the United States, you don't want your country involved in overseas military operate. I understand yes. all of that. But uh, I think they were encouraged. I think it could have had some impact. But it, there was, there's an inevitability about um, uh, China and Russia getting closer together. But don't assume that uh, the learnings for China out of Ukraine will make China more belligerent. I think a lot of the strategists in Beijing would be looking at what's happening in Ukraine saying, gee, if we had a lightning strike on Taiwan and took it over, we'd spend the next 20 years trying to subjugate this rebellious province. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's the case because the Taiwanese now don't feel Chinese. Mm -hmm. I mentioned in the book the Pew Research that said 66% yes. regard themselves as Taiwanese and only 20% regard themselves as as Chinese and Taiwanese and the minuscule regard themselves as Chinese. Yeah. Now, they have a sense of their own identity. One of the issues is we have to remember, and, and, and I think there's no doubt that uh, some electorates at the last election that have high Chinese enrolments uh, probably moved a little more against the coalition than we might have wanted. I um, mean, I know one of them well. I used to represent it. Mm, and I yes. was a bit surprised in the end that we lost that seat. Mm. Uh, I thought we would have held on to Ben Long. And, and there's no criticism of our candidate. I thought he was very good. But I do think that we have to be very careful in criticising China to make absolutely certain that it is not seen in any way as being anti-Chinese. Because right. we, we have 1.4 million Australians who have Chinese heritage and it's the most widely spoken foreign language in our country. Yeah. I have hogged you. Quite enough. Uh, would anybody like to kick off with a first question? Yes, sir, down the back. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the voice and, and the possibilities it brings to Parliament. Well, I wouldn't presume to be an expert on it because uh, it's not necessarily something I've encouraged. Let me, to the extent that I can now, make it clear that I would be in favour 
of an amendment to the Constitution which recognised the historical truth that the first occupants of the Commonwealth of Australia, what is now the land mass of the Commonwealth of Australia, were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, because that's true. I have no argument with that. I worry about the potential for the voice to create a capacity in a future High Court of Australia to interpret it in a way that is not intended. This idea that you can um, create through the Constitution a body which cannot be defined by future uh, judicial interpretation, I, in my understanding of constitutional law, is a bit of a myth. Um, and I would have thought at the very least those who think the voice is a good idea, and I don't doubt the goodwill of some of those who are promoting it, I would have thought the best way might be to trial it in legislation and, and to see how it worked, but I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, advocating that. And the other thing that has to be said is that the voice is but one of three recommendations coming from what is styled as the Uralu, Uralu statement from the heart, and the other two are truth-telling and um, treaty-making. Now, let me say, I think the, the very notion of a nation making a treaty with itself is absurd, and I don't think that will ever be accepted. So I would like the debate to proceed, at least on this understanding, that opposing or supporting the voice should not be seen as some virility test of your compassion for Indigenous people. We should not have a state of affairs where if you don't support the voice, you're against helping Indigenous people. They are still, as a group, heavily disadvantaged. I mean, I've never had any hesitation in saying that. I'm impressed by what's been said by Jacinta Price, the new CLP senator from the North, who, who understands and lives there. I mean, she's a shared experience of an Indigenous mother and, 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 and uh, um, an Irish-descended father. I mean, she she's understands. Now, I'm not saying she's the only one that understands. I don't criticise the other. But I think they're all... I, I, you know, it, it, mm. This idea that unless you support the voice, you, you know, you're unsympathetic. Uh, yeah. Well, the ad campaign started, hasn't it, with Shaquille? Um, right, next, next question. Um, good evening, Ms. Howard. My name is Stephen. Uh, I'm an Australian citizen so with a Chinese background, Chinese descent. So my next question will be in relation to the potential conflict for China and Taiwan. And will potential military involvement in the, uh, in the conflict represent or constitute key interests for Australia? I mean, um, for, for mature and stable bilateral relations between nations, isn't it true that uh, what is needed is respecting the differences and looking for common ground rather than being fearful and critical of the political and the cultural values of the other. I mean, on one side, we've got the second largest economy of the world and a rising power, which is China. And on the other side, we've got a, I wouldn't call it a nation, but uh, an economy that we seem to share the common value of democratic society and system. And uh, isn't that true for a country like Australia? Uh, what is needed is to form its own independent views and directives in this rapid and uh, dramatic change in global geopolitical landscape. Although it's rather important also to maintain and strengthen our key strategic alliances with key allies like the United States. Thank well, you. I certainly think that we should have our own independent view, and we do, but that doesn't mean that it can't be the same as the United States. I mean, this idea that because we agree with the United States on something, that view and that decision has been dictated by the United States is ludicrous. I mean, it's in our interest as a democratic country about the same population size, incidentally, as Taiwan, to applaud how democratic Taiwan is. And Taiwan has had changes of government. The Kuomintang, which was the successor to Chiang Kai-shek's uh, movement and, and, and then a more independent 
um, party which has sometimes been in power over the last 30 or 40 years. I mean, the point I make very clearly is it's in everybody's interest not to have military conflict between Taiwan and China. That doesn't help anybody. And we have to be patient. We have to put up with apparent contradictions and ambiguities. But if it keeps the peace, then it makes a lot of sense. But part of keeping the peace is uh, to remind the Beijing government that we are a close and supportive ally of the United States. Don't always do what the United States wants, but it is in our interests to remain close to the United States because we have common values. We believe fundamentally in the same things and uh, we have to remain close to Japan. Japan is a very, very important ally. I mean, I um, think in the time that I was Prime Minister, I, I grew in different ways to value the importance of Japan as an ally and how extraordinary it was that uh, we could, over decades, have developed a close relationship with a country that was greatly despised uh, as a result of what occurred in, in World War II, it was a level of our maturity as a, as a country. So. Mm. I, I think we have to, um, in relation to China and Taiwan, we have to accept the ambiguities. We should not be panicked into making false choices. The only choice, in my view, that's viable for Australia is to maintain the integrity of our belief in democracy and also to recognise the deterrent effect of strong military alliances. I thought AUKUS, AUKUS, wherever language you want to use, was a terrific achievement of the Morrison government. And I'm glad that the Albanese opposition then supported it, because it means that it has to continue that support in government. Um, and uh, uh, I thought that was, and I think the Quad made a lot of sense. I mean, the thing that unites those four countries is they're all democracies. I mean, one of the things you've got to remember is that, I mean, much and all as I found Jiang Zemin a, a believer in... Um, uh, an amusing companion and interesting, and he liked Shakespeare and all of that. Truth is that he was a communist dictator, and and uh, under his regime, the Muslim, the eager Muslims, were persecuted, uh, as they've continued to be. And we just got to keep those things in mind. Yes, sir. During your time as Prime Minister, Mr. Howard, you presented yourself as an economic libertarian and a social conservative. My question to you is, does that formula still work for the Liberal Party after this year's election defeat? In particular, in particular, does it work in those well-off Liberal seats that were lost to the Teals, given that there seemed to be strong support in those seats for what you might call progressive opinion rather than conservative cultural opinion? So the question is, does this formula still work? And if so, how should the Liberal Party redefine social conservatism? Well, Paul, I think it, it does still work because it's the reality and it's also more likely to gather more people under the Liberal tent if properly explained and argued uh, than any alternative. My criticism, and I make this in the book, is that uh, on many issues, which you might group in the socially conservative category, the Liberal Party was tepid, almost silent, and, and, and therefore disappointed many of its supporters. I mean, I remember uh, some couple of years ago when, the, when that controversy raged over the so-called safe schools, I complained to... Um, uh, some Liberals in the New South Wales government. I said, what are you saying about it? And they said, oh, well, you know, you'll find on page six, you know, such and such a paper in the next couple of days, some mm. mild criticism. And I said, I don't want mild criticism. People want uh, the party to get off the fence. And, and you and also said it was the cumulative, the addition of yeah, these Yeah, the cumulative. See, I issues. mean, I had people say to me, oh, John, don't worry about that. Don't get excited. It's not important. Well... In itself, it might be important, but after a while, uh, people get, they develop, you know, their cumulative unhappiness rises to a level of anger. 
And, and people would say to me, oh, the, those conservatives have got nowhere to go. Well, a lot of them found somewhere to go uh, in May and we lost power. Um, and don't, don't assume that you can take the socially conservative vote for uh, granted. And don't assume that um, some people who would normally support uh, the Liberal Party on many of these issues wouldn't find in certain Labor figures, uh, particularly but not only at a state level, uh, a sufficient level of conservatism to switch their vote. This idea that, I mean, I mean, one of the other things I've said, Paul, over the years is that when I was first heavily involved in politics, I thought the community was 40-40-20, 40 Liberal, 40 Labor, 20 moved around. Now I think it's closer to being 30-30-40. Now, that's an exaggeration, but certainly this idea that you've, you've got a, a rusted-on constituent you can take for granted, I still think it's the right balance because it is my, and not only accords with my own beliefs, and obviously you don't espouse something for your party unless it's part of your, your core belief system, but it does seem to me that the, the Liberal Party has done best when it's got the balance right between its social conservatism and its economic liberalism. And we certainly did that in, in, in the time that I was in power. And I think um, in the, the periods that we've been in power since, uh, you can see an ebb and flow. But none of these things are fixed. But the point is you've got to understand the philosophical framework in which you are arguing policy. It's, it, it's no good just um, jumping from one a passion to another, uh, uh, according to, to pollsters. Now, you mentioned quite rightly climate change. I mean, I, I admit that uh, to a lot of people, conservative people, climate change is, is a vexing issue. Do I think that was the main reason why people voted for the Teals in Wentworth and North Sydney and Goldstein? I think it was one of the reasons. But I think the more dominant reason was that they had got tired of us. They Do didn't you, want to vote Labor. Do you think there's a... And one of the reasons yeah. they got tired of us, they felt we'd lost our philosophical direction. Mm. And do you think there's been any change? Because, of course, since the election, we've had the Ukrainian mm. crisis really bite on energy and we've seen this real problem with... Uh, Europe in particular, and even people like Mike Cannon Brooks saying, "Oh well, maybe we'll keep that coal-fired power station on a little bit longer." You know, oh, isn't that generous um, of him? Yeah. And so, uh, uh, and so, I just wonder whether the, the the teals would have to shift if if put on if skewered, you know, on this issue now too. Well, to quote. Chow and lie on the French Revolution. It's too early to tell. But uh, the, the, time, the time sequences are different. But um, I think it is too early to tell. But what you're alluding to is quite possible. Um, I, I think the dynamics of the climate change debate uh, could alter a lot mm. over the next six or 12 months. I, I do. Now, who else? Yes, over here. Uh, Mr Howard, Ms Fullerton, thank you. My name is Dan Crennan. I wanted to ask you, Mr Howard, about the potential for unwinding some of what I would perceive at least to be some of the key reforms of the last term of government, one being in relation to superannuation, the other being in relation to securities class actions. Without going into morbid detail, one was designed to protect the use of members' money and prevent members' money from being used for arguably politicised and other non-financial purposes. The other one was to make class actions more difficult in this country and similar to America and the UK. In other words, having to prove fault on the part of the officers of the company. Now, the Labor Party, the current government, seem to have indicated that they might seek to unwind those reports, uh, sorry, reforms. One is designed to protect the members and their money and one is designed to protect the present day investors and the companies and the financial system. Do you think they have real appetite to entirely un unwind those reforms? And my second question is if they do do that, do you think that will be politically damaging? Will the electorate understand that those protections will be removed? Well, look, I, 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 the answer to the first question, I don't know whether they've got the appetite or the desire to do it. I just am not... 
sufficiently well informed as to the forward thinking of the new government to answer that. Uh, how do I think the electorate would react? Look, I think um, they could react um, uh, to anything that looks as though it's leaving members' money more exposed. Um, and um, as far as class actions are concerned, well, it, it's, it's a fairly... Uh, esoteric's probably the wrong word, but it's a slightly elitist sort of argument. I mean, a lot of it is bound up with people's attitudes to the avarice of sections of the legal profession. Uh, and and now, I mean, that is uh, an outrageous thing for... Uh, I thought on the first, hasn't the legislation been wound back anyway, already? Not the best financial interest. No. Right. No. Right. Um, yep. So I, I'm, I, you know, I have to plead sort of... Um, I, I wish I knew more uh, to be able to properly answer your question. I mean, superannuation, of course, is, is broader than those things, and there's no, there's no doubt that many people in the Labor Party see um, uh, the power of industry superannuation funds as being the answer to the decline in trade union membership and of all of the products of the non-joiner society in which we're now part. That, that's the most egregious of all. When I was elected to Parliament, trade union membership was in the late 40s. It's now down to about 14%. If you think that's a catastrophic, not a catastrophic decline, yet yeah, institutional power. I, um, I'm reminded, if I may say so, of a wonderful little letter in The Australian today. A fellow said, I noticed the new defence minister says he wants the Australian army to look like Australia. He said, that bit rich coming from a government loaded with trade union leaders and party hacks. <laughs> aren't, aren't the... Uh, isn't industry super, though? Does, doesn't it have a problem in terms of the returns oh, yes. that it is needing to get for its members? I mean, how is it going to get these returns if productivity uh, isn't increased? Yeah, well, that, uh, that applies to all sections of... <laughs> I mean, people are not going to make profits uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a sustainable way unless productivity is lifted. You're not going to lift productivity until you um, have more lasting reforms to industrial relations and taxation. Mm. And you won't do that by pretending that you can have a one-size-fits-all industrial relations approach to small business. I've never... I mean, I'd, I, you know, I'll be fascinated to see the detail of that. Um, Won't we all? Uh, I agreement. think business I mean, was I mean, very... Maybe it's an yeah. agreement. You know, we want to work together. We want to be point one, number two. We want to be nice to each other. And, and point number three, we want everybody paid a decent wage. I mean, we're all in favour of that. But the idea... Well, that, what's she doing, um, I think? The Cosboa lady. Well, I don't know. I didn't want to get to that level of detail. <laughs> That's up to your profession. <laughs> we'll have a dig, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, just following on from the question about superannuation, uh, Mr Howard, would you be able to comment on this idea that superannuation uh, should be used more for nation building, so it should be used for child I am very wary of anything that involves the conscription of investment. Yeah, so uh, childcare, um, no, nursing no, homes, look, 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 I, you know, renewable energy. I, I never energy. think we should abandon the, the market tests, and, the, and I, I really don't. I, I never thought that, you know, I don't think that makes sense. I mean, allow. I mean, if you want investment in nation building, have good investment rules and have good taxation rules and IR rules that encourage that investment. If you want to help childcare, um, invest in it. The government invests. Remember, years ago when we were having debates about controlling interest rates, and oh, people would say to me, "Oh, John, you can't deregulate interest rates." You, you know, they'll go through the roof. And that was a nonsense argument because, you know, what goes in goes out. And <clears throat> in the end, if you want a proper flow of money for housing, you've got to have a <clears throat> free market. But I mean, my argument then, the argument a lot of people was that if you want to subsidise people, then you, you use the budget to do it. You don't impose some kind of directional constraint on the market. And... And in a, in a sense, it's the same argument with superannuation, exactly the same. I mean, it's dressed up differently and people talk about childcare. I mean, it's all very appealing and there seems to be a consensus that no matter what your income, a consensus emerging, no matter what your income is, that 
you've got to be subsidised in a childcare. That's a, an interesting form. Especially when you may not be going to work or working from home not. Yeah, yeah, Just well, dropping the kids uh, off. Well, I mean, well, I mean it's... Seriously. It's, it's, you know, these are, but, but you've got to drill down to what, you know, what is really involved. And anything that fundamentally that doesn't pass some kind of market test has got to be seen with great suspicion. Mm. Another question. Hi, Mr Howard. Yes. Um, I have a question regarding the NGIS. Mm. Um, so the Gillard government brought in the NGIS in 2013. By the time it was rolled out to myself in 2018, mm. um, the Liberals had the NGIS. Um, given um, it's close to my heart... Um, mm. oh, sorry, I'm... <laughs> No, I understand. I got a bit nervous. Sorry about this. No, don't, don't be. So, uh, given uh, the sustainability of the NGIS at the moment, can you discuss further your thoughts on the longevity of the program? Oh, look, I think it's here to stay. Um, um, I do. That doesn't mean to say that there aren't some problems, uh, some weaknesses, some abuses. Um, particularly by some of the providers uh, in it. But I, I would be astonished if there were any fundamental shift in approach by the Liberal Party to it. Um, I, I, I mean, I remember towards the end of my government, we'd moved to a, a proposal that um, uh, Mal Bruff had put forward when he was Social Security Minister for really giving people vouchers up to a certain value and they could purchase whatever assistance they thought was suitable for them. Now, that was a long way short of the NDIS, but it was introduced, as I recall, with bipartisan support um, and, and it had the support of state governments uh, of both political persuasions. My judgment is that although there will be some strong, even fierce debate about uh, some of the uh, deficiencies at the margin, I, I would be astonished if the coalition withdraw its, withdrew its basic support. Quite, quite astonished. And I would not agree with that anyway. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Tiki Fulton and John Howard. <laughs> For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved.